Well, good evening and welcome to Southern Wisconsin, USA, Jefferson County, near the town of Fort Atkinson, where I grew up. And this is the family farm, and I'm glad that you're with us this evening. I'm back here visiting my mother for a few days, and we just finished a fish fry at the Fireside Restaurant, and the light is so good. Obviously, it's a little hot and muggy here. But the light was so good, I said, hey, I'm just gonna grab the camera and, and, get, and gadget and gadget. <laughs> what? I'm gonna grab the camera and film a little bit. Our episode tonight involves glaciers. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. This is a special, unique episode, I guess that means the same thing, of Nick on the Fly. I'm home in southern Wisconsin. This is the family farm. And this hill behind me that you can see, let me stop and give you a quick view before we lose the sun completely. Ah, isn't that nice? This is the family farm, and uh, as a teenager, I was unhappy being here working so hard with my dad, but now, of course, as an older person, I appreciate all that time that I had with him. Um, this is a drumlin, a glacial drumlin, one of thousands and thousands of drumlins uh, all through the upper Midwest. And of course, you go, well, wait a minute, I've got a drumlin where I live, and I'm sure you do. But the drumlins are imp particularly impressive here in southern Wisconsin. Flying in, you can see them. Looking on Google Earth, you can see them. The drumlins are hills that have a very specific shape. And that shape is not a pat, not an accident. The, the, the shape of these drumlins is uh, kind of bulbous on the north, and then they thin. They pinch down to the south. You're looking south right now. So this is one of the biggest drumlins in Jefferson County, but there are others as well. We don't have the biggest and the best, but we got a big one. And it makes up the majority of our farm, this big drumlin. Why do these hills have this tail going to the south? That has perplexed geologists for a long time. And there's now a new idea compared to an old idea for how these drumlins form. It's gonna get noisy because I'm gonna go right next to US Highway 12, but there's a reason for that. And maybe I'll just keep this going and tell you the quick story. I had my first geological thought here in 1979 when I was just entering the senior year of high school. The last thing on my mind was geology. But I was out here working and the highway department decided this curve here on US Highway 12 is too dangerous. And my dad was particularly ticked off that they were gonna cut into our hill. Can I do this without a bun of traffic? And maybe we'll be okay. Right here, I'm gonna flip you around. So this is the spot. Muffler boy. This is the spot that was completely exposed. In other words, the heavy machines in 1979 just cut a face, cut a clean face into our hill that's since been filled in. And exposed in our hill was sand and gravel and boulders. And even as a 17 year old, I was shocked that all these heavy pieces of equipment that I was hauling back and forth over the top of this hill, the hill is all we called it. We didn't call it a drumlin. I couldn't believe the hill was made out of just a bunch of sand and gravel and occasional big boulders. It just didn't make any sense to me. Why wouldn't it just smush out under all that weight of a big heavy hay load? Well, I now realize that there's inherent strength to a drumlin and there's a very specific uh, depositional origin, or is there?
that I had no idea why this hill was here until I went to the University of Wisconsin. And I took a glacial geology class from David Michelson. And Michelson, uh, especially on one Saturday trip, drove us around in a bus and st started pointing out that these hills were all drumlins. And the idea is that a drumlin is a hill made out of glacial till, made out of loose sand and, excuse me, loose sand and gravel, and also a fair amount of um, boulder material glacial deposits in other words but the hill has a specific shape if you are a, a self-respecting drumlin here in southern Wisconsin and around the world I guess you better make sure that you are not a conical hill that's more of a came but instead you better make sure that you have a teardrop shape and that's what I'd really like to talk to you about here let me flip you around And so the idea with the drumlins back in the 80s from all the leading geology experts was that these drumlins are depositional features that for some reason, I remember my dad had trouble with this. He'd say, well, I don't get it. Why would this happen? For some reason, a bunch of, I don't know, cookie dough would just drop out of the bottom of the glacier. The Canadian ice sheet is what we're talking about. No alpine glaciers here. There's no mountains. This is Southern Wisconsin. So there was a thick Canadian ice sheet here on the family farm, and you'd drop these uh, spoonfuls of chocolate chip cookie dough. But you're doing it at the bottom of the ice sheet, and the ice sheet is continuing to flow over that ball of cookie dough. Well, what's gonna happen? You're gonna deform the cookie dough. You're gonna take the cookie dough, and you're gonna streamline it out. And let me get you oriented properly. We're going down into the woods of our property. Oh wait, you can't see that. So you're looking south. So basically think of me, think of my head as a batch of cookie dough that just got dropped. And now you're coming up and over my head and shaving off the top of my head and you're gonna streamline that material down ice. Let me try it again. To make a drumlin, according to glacial geologists in the 1980s, drop some glacial till underneath the ice and then have the ice flow over that pile so that there's a, a teardrop or a tail down ice of where that stuff was originally dropped. The point is, these drumlins in southern Wisconsin, including this hill that you're listening to me talk on right now, terrible grammar, has a tail drifting to the south. And all of them, they all, from the air, these drumlins in southern Wisconsin look like salmon that are swimming to the north. All their tails are on the south side and they're all pointing behind you, they're all pointing north. So that was the thought. These, these drumlins are depositional features where the ice is flowing. Okay, well things have changed. And I don't know right now how much they've changed. And I don't know if this is a, a minority opinion or if this is now the majority opinion. But I have read enough about a new idea with drumlins that I thought I would share this with you. The idea is the drumlins, instead of being what I just described, depositional features, instead the new idea is the drumlins are only things left. The new idea is that the drumlins are the only thing left. That there was once a thick blanket of glacial till here at the farm. But that when the ice was here, there was powerful shoots of water, high velocity water shooting underneath the ice. You can think of them as under ice rivers if you want. But the point is, if you have a bunch of water surging underneath an ice sheet that's especially uh, retreating, you can take a bunch of glacial till away and what you're left with, the stuff that didn't get swept away by the fire hose are the drumlins. Do you see how those are two competing ideas that both are trying to explain teardrop shaped hills here in Southern Wisconsin and many other places around the world that had continental ice? That's the idea. My goodness.
Let's do a little bit more walking. I dreamt it was just a pile of sand and gravel. So that stuck in my mind. And then when I went to the University of Wisconsin and started learning about glacial geology and I started learning about drumlins, it all clicked. And I think that's a lesson for a bunch of this geology. It only really clicks beautifully for you if you've been to these places and you kind of have experienced these places with a totally different set of eyes. And then if somebody comes in and tells you a story about what happened, you've already done the hard work. You've already kind of sized up the feature with your own eyes and your other senses. And maybe you even have a memory, a personal memory from that place. And then if somebody tells you a little bit of geology, it sticks immediately. And that's what happened here. So whenever I think of drumlins, I hear the word drumlin, I go to a conference and have people talking about drumlins. I think of this drumlin, this big drumlin on the family farm in southern Wisconsin. Now, I think we should go down to the barn before I totally lose light and show you some of the boulders that have been collected over the years on this farm and have been used to build the foundation of our barn back in 1940. That's how we'll finish this little episode. I sure do appreciate you joining us. It's my mom's car. Let's, uh, let's jump in and see if we have any light left to show you a couple of the boulders in the foundation. Um, my dad passed away last summer and so there's been a big auction here. So the tractors are gone and a lot of the old stuff that my dad had acquired over the years is gone. That's a good thing. It was just a bunch of stuff that only he really valued. Um, and it's great to see this place uh, in such good shape. Now there's no irrigation here, so this is all, all this green you see is it's just from the amount of rainfall that happens on a regular basis. If you're unfamiliar with the with the upper Midwest. Uh-oh, I don't have my seatbelt on. Patrick, sorry. Oh, that beeping is going to bug me. So I think what I want to do to finish the episode here is to get us over to the foundation and we'll pop out before we lose some light and give you a chance to see some of the beautiful erratics with the Canadian Glacier right now. It's a barn that I painted by hand in 1983. I just come back from Glacier National Park and discovered the West and discovered geology. And, and I said, uh, well, I got three months. Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do between October and January. And my dad's like, uh, well, you could paint the barn. Here's a paintbrush. <laughs> so I went crazy. Uh, mentally, probably. At least I had a radio that summer or that fall. All right, well, let's see if I can't just show you a couple of these wonderful boulders. place is overgrown. I wish you could see it when it was in its prime, but I painted this with a skinny little paintbrush and we had uh, hay ele elevators, if you know elevators, so I'd keep moving the elevator to get up high. So here's what a typical foundation looks like of a barn in southern Wisconsin. It was, uh, let's give you a date for the for this barn, it's a kind of a new new barn, not compared to turn of the century barns that are, are common around here. But these are the erratics, these are the glacial boulders that have been found on this property and of course used in the creation of the foundation of this barn. And you know, as a geologist, you kind of say, well, my God, these are all Canadian rocks then, I guess. And the answer is true. Yes, that's true. There's some, there's some 
beautiful purple quartzite, more purple quartzite, some kind of a red granite, a salt and pepper granite. I mean, you know rocks as well as I do, I'm sure. But my main point of this episode is not only to talk about drumlins and how they form, but to also talk about how somebody can live, talking about me now, how somebody can live for so long staring at a foundation like this every day and never wonder about the foundation, never wonder about the rocks, never wonder like, where did, why do we have these rocks here? What story do these rocks have to tell? And it wasn't until I went to the University of Wisconsin and started taking geology classes that I realized that there's a glacial signature for this entire farm. And this is the most dramatic example to look at some of the, <laughs> to, uh, some of the red paint that I spilled in 1983, but also to gaze back and realize that many of these erratics came from that drumlin or places down low.